So thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's a great honour and privilege to be invited here. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yes, indeed, I was um, a coordinating lead author of the fifth assessment report. Um, and I was involved with my colleague, Professor Nathan Bindoff, who's from the University of Tasmania in Australia, in leading the chapter that looked at the causes of climate change. And uh, we were right at the centre of formulating the best words to sum up the evidence, uh, which was, uh, as you said, uh, human influence on the climate system is clear. But of course, that was a, a statement that was agreed by the entire scientific team. And then, of course, that was a statement that was agreed by the governments in the final plenary meeting. And I think for me, one of the great strengths of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is that the governments see the scientific evidence um, and they, they, they agree that, that what we have formulated as the scientific team is the correct assessment of the current state of the science. And that provides um, those governments the, the information they need to take forward to then formulate how they respond to that challenge in the context of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So in my talk, really, I want to, to sort of pick up some of the threads that we heard this morning, actually, from Dr. Connor Murphy, um, and expand a little bit more about what this uh, changing world of ours means in terms of the impacts. Um, one degree Celsius is roughly where we are now relative to pre-industrial levels. And um, in some ways, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you this, but one degree Celsius may sound to many people like a relatively small amount we, of course, know that the, the temperatures over the course of a day will change in a particular place by more than that. But, of course, what we have to remember is that that one degrees Celsius is the average over the entire globe. It's the average over the entire year. It's a very large-scale average. And, in fact, those large-scale averages vary relatively little um, naturally. Um, if you think about the major natural perturbation to the climate system, the El Nino southern oscillation, you may have heard about the El Nino phenomena in the Pacific Ocean, that may raise temperatures in a year by about a tenth of a degree Celsius. So now we're at about a degree Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels. And you've heard this morning about um, future projections and what this, this could mean if we go to high levels of warming, if we go to two degrees, three degrees, or even if we go further on from that, which are the sorts of levels that we would expect to go to by the end of this century if we do not reduce our emissions and we carry on in a sort of business as usual scenario. So what I want to talk about quite a lot in the next few minutes is about extreme weather. Um, and I want to say a little bit more about this developing science of how we, we address this question of is there a link and what is that link between uh, extreme weather events and man-made climate change or indeed natural climate variability? And of course, as you've already heard uh, in this meeting so far, this is important because it's giving us information about the extent to which we need to adapt and it's giving us important information about how we potentially avoid the worst effects of climate change. And what I've personally seen just in the last few years actually, and we've already heard reference to this this morning is I think there's a growing awareness, um, as I'm now learning actually today in Ireland, and there's a growing awareness in the UK as well, about our vulnerability to extreme weather. And we've had a series of, of storms, of course, we've had a series of wet winters. Um, that has led to uh, flooding here in Ireland, it has led to flooding in the UK. The, the picture there on the bottom, uh, in the middle, on the bottom there, is the, is the railway line that goes to Cornwall, not far from where I live, actually, next to, which was washed away, which was destroyed in the floods of January 2014. Um, and if I just stick on the theme of floods for a minute um, and think about some of the recent winters, so the, the, the chart you have on the right there is actually a collaboration between Met Aaron and the Met Office to produce a combined map for both Ireland and the UK of the rainfall anomalies, in other words, the, the average rainfall relative to a climatological average uh, in December 2015. And you can see, if you look at that map, you can see that um, particularly in the southern part of Ireland and also in the northwestern part of England, you can see in that month that rainfall levels were 
uh, over 300 percent, so uh, over three times the, the average, the, the longer term average, um, at least as expressed as 1981 to 2010 values. And associated to that, with that were a series of storms. Um, Storm Frank, bringing uh, torrential rain and strong winds to many areas of Ireland, including County Cork. And that followed on from Storm Desmond early in the month, which caused flooding and power, power outages in this country. And indeed, in the, another context to this is that in the UK context, the, the, um, the impacts that we saw in the UK had, a, had political repercussions because it really brought home to, to the people involved and also to the government about the vulnerability that we needed to address. And in the UK, we had the National Flood Resilience Review, which was convened to look at, if you like, why, why did we um, suffer such uh, consequences? Why were we not better adapted to, to what we saw? And um, of course, another thing to say, and I'm going to fold this into the discussion, is it's not just about winter flooding, but also flash flooding in, in summer as well. And, of course, you'll, you'll know that, that you'll know better than me, in fact, that just last month you had uh, severe flash flooding in County Donegal. And, and this is an example, and another example, of where you had statistics like a monthly, the expected monthly rainfall falling in just a few hours and, and providing really severe flash floods. So the question then becomes, what is the link between these events and climate change, um, and how might these change in future? So I just want to take another uh, step back and just reinforce really what we've already heard from Dr. Connor Murphy um, about this question of, of the confidence we have in the fact that climate is changing as a result of human influence, as a result of the greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, which now mean that the, as you heard earlier today, that the concentrations in the atmosphere are now more than 400 parts per million by volume, and that compares to 280 parts per million pre-industrial levels. And these, by the way, are levels that we we will probably not go, well, we will certainly not um, go below probably in our lifetimes um, these levels of 400 parts per million. So what the chart you have there is another version of the chart you've already seen. This is taken from the IPCC report that we worked on for the fifth assessment report. The black line shows you the global average temperatures year by year. Um, and you can see how they vary. You can see how some years are warmer and some years are colder, but you can see a general warming trend. The uh, blue spread of uh, temperatures is the temperatures that you see in the climate models when they just include natural factors. So we have explosive volcanic eruptions. We've taken those into account. We've taken account of variability in solar output. We've taken account of the fact, and the models produce this as an emergent property of the models. Um, they produce El Ninos and La Ninos. They produce this warming and cooling as a natural process uh, of, the, of how the atmosphere and the oceans work together. You can see that the observations are now lying well outside the plume of what we would expect just by natural climate variability. But then if you compare the black curve with the red uh, spread of, of temperatures, then you can see how consistent the observations are with our understanding when we include that in the climate models, and we do include the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. And it's evidence such as that that led to the IPCC's conclusion, human influence on the climate system is clear, and it is extremely likely, which is a greater than 95% confidence in that statement, that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming that we've seen since the mid-20th century. So what does that then mean for extremes? And at one level, actually, this is really quite simple. It's quite a simple consequence of basic physics. And this is what makes the, the case here really so compelling, I think. We have some quite um, uh, detailed and, and actually quite complex scientific work to do to tease out exactly what future climate change will mean here in Ireland, what it will mean in the UK, what it will mean in different parts of the world. But there is some basic, really basic physics that's, that's telling us that, that there are significant changes already underway and that they will carry on and they'll become worse if we continue emitting greenhouse gases. And the first basic point, which is shown by this graph, is that with a shift in the average temperatures, even by relatively small amounts, that can have quite 
dramatic effects on the risk of having very hot extreme temperatures. So the point of this graph, it shows a distribution. So there's, there's, two, of, there's two lines here. There's a dashed line and a solid line. And the dashed line is, is the, the climate uh, that, that, we, that we used to have. It's the climate that we, that we might have had if we hadn't already changed the climate. And that distribution is telling you that sometimes the temperatures are hotter, sometimes the temperatures are colder. These might be, for example, monthly temperatures in, in Dublin, for example. Um, you don't, of course, always get the average temperatures, as, as, of course, we all know well. But the point is that when that curve shifts to warmer temperatures, and that's what the solid line is showing you, then the chances of being in, the, in that um, red part of the curve increase quite dramatically. Uh, in this case, you can see there's, there's probably about twice the chance that you're going to see those really hot temperatures, simply because the area under the curve has increased by about two in this particular schematic example. And that's coming about from a relatively small shift in that distribution of the mean temperatures. And this is just a basic fact of, of how, how the system works. Um, now, as I said, there is some, some um, more detailed scientific work to be done to try to tease out exactly what this means for, for different places and so on. And I've actually been involved in a, in a report uh, which has been going now, we've, 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 we've up to the sixth version of this report now. You can see there are six different uh, covers of this report there. We started back in 2012 looking at extreme events uh, of 2011, extreme weather and climate events, and the, 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 the forthcoming issue which is coming out um, in probably towards the end of October or early November, so this is a, a, a draft copy of our cover, um, which incidentally is looking at coral reefs, and we have, we have some very clear evidence now that <laughs> coral reefs are really suffering really badly because of, uh, because of human-induced climate change. But the point about these reports is that this is part of the scientific endeavor to really look at individual extremes and say, how are they, how are they changing and how are they linked to climate change? Now, there's a website called carbonbrief.org, um, and that has um, some really quite nice information um, related to climate change on it. And recently, the, um, the people who, who work at carbonbrief.org have produced this, this graphic. And basically, what they've tried to do there is look at all the different studies that are being made, all the scientific studies that have been made about heat waves and floods and droughts, um, fires, um, and uh, indeed, also very cold, uh, unusually cold uh, extremes. And they've tried to see what is the evidence linking or not linking these events to <coughs> human-induced climate change. And you see this cycling through. You'll see that we're now starting to look all around the world. It takes time to build up the capacity of scientists uh, in Africa, for example, or in South America. But that capacity is gradually developing so that, the, so that the scientists in those countries can start to look at what's happening in their own region. The point about this is that you can see that if you look at the human link, which is, co which is coming up now, you'll see that there are many, many uh, pointers on that graph, many, many extreme events now. You can say quite definitively that there is a link to human-induced climate change. There are still quite a few where the science is inconclusive, and there are some studies which show that actually it's much more natural variability that's driving it. But the point to make here is that the dominant influence overall is being seen of human-induced climate change. And what is coming through really, really clearly is the impact on heat waves. And that comes back to the schematic I showed you earlier. It's, it's a sort of basic consequence of how um, the, the climate system works, that as we move the mean temperatures to higher levels, the chances of having heat waves really increases really strongly. I was involved in a study um, quite a long time ago, actually, back in 2004, looking at the European heat wave of 2003. And this was a real wake-up call to Europe. 75,000 people were estimated to have died in that heat wave. Um, and the question then became, that really, I think, shocked uh, citizens of Europe, and it shocked the politicians that this could happen uh, in, in, a, in our modern age, if you like. And the question was, is there a link to climate change? And at the, up to that point, the mantra had always been, well, we can talk generalities, but we can't make a link to an individual event. And what we did, we looked in a risk-based context, which you've already heard about today. And we, we did a study on this. Um, the graph on the right there shows you, actually, in black, 
the, the, sorry, the European temperatures as ob observed. On the green, it shows you climate models that just include natural factors. On the red, it includes climate models that include greenhouse gas concentrations rising and human-induced climate change as well. Back in 2004, we found that human influence had very likely at least doubled the chances of those summer, extreme summer temperatures. And we looked at that again, actually. We, we, stood, we published a paper in 2014 that said, well, what has happened since? And what we found that what has happened since is the predictions that we made a decade before had indeed uh, become true. So there was a, we made a prediction back then. We, we could compare what had happened in the intervening 10 years. And yes, we have seen temperatures continue to rise. And yes, we have seen more heat waves in Europe. And um, the, the heat wave that's been dubbed uh, heat wave Lucifer that affected um, this, this, this summer, indeed, that affected Italy and the Mediterranean. Again, that led, I believe it led to us, uh, I think it was a 15% increase in hospital emissions in Italy, for example. Temperatures in the mid-40s uh, in the Mediterranean region. So this is all consistent with what we were saying uh, a decade ago. So that's heat waves. So I want to say a few remarks again about now about flooding uh, and, and heavy rainfall events. The... Um, the 2013-14 winter, actually, a little bit like the, the, heat, the, the heat wave um, back in 2003, this was a bit of a wake-up call, um, I believe, about our vulnerability to, to winter rainfall now. And we did a study where we looked at this. And what we concluded was the weather patterns that we were associated with this. Of course they were. So there was a sequence of storms coming across the Atlantic, continually rolling over. Um, both Ireland and the UK, bringing heavy rainfall. But the point being that we assess that as a result of climate change, um, and this, in this particular metric, extreme rainfall over 10 consecutive days, having that amount of rain had now become seven times more likely when we had that type of weather situation. When we think about extreme weather and its impacts, we need to remember about sea level rise we have satellite data on sea level rise, so we can be very confident that sea level rise is rising at about 3.4 uh, millimeters per year. And this is the data from the satellite showing you the, how uh, sea level is rising. That, have, that has an impact on storm <laughs> surges, because when we get the storms, they, they're coming on the top of a, of a raised sea level. So now I want to have a little, again, to sort of taking up this theme of thinking about what the, what the, the basic physics is telling us. So a warmer atmosphere, and this is where I'm talking about what, I, what I'm going to call thermodynamic changes. A warmer atmosphere means there's a greater chance of extreme temperatures. There's more moisture in the air. It's, it's about 6% or so more moisture in the air for every degree of warming. So again, if we think of a degree of warming as a relatively small amount, but then we think, well, what does that mean? 6% is, is, as you, of course, can think, quite a large amount. There's more energy to drive the storms from that latent heat of condensation from that energy you're driving into the climate system, and there's a greater potential for heavy rainfall. Having said that, we still have variations in how our storm tracks and our ocean currents are varying. And that can lead to enhanced or reduced risk of extreme weather in a particular place. And these are very variable. And there's some interesting and important science to be done in trying to understand how the storm tracks and how the ocean currents are changing. So there is there is some element of scientific uncertainty there that we need to, we need to bear in mind, but, but notwithstanding what, I've, what I'm trying to emphasize about the thermodynamic changes, the, the basic implications of a warmer atmosphere and heavier rainfall. So when storms do form, they're more likely to be more extreme, and with sea level rise, there are an, inc an increased risk of storm surges and coastal inundation. I, I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes on, on this graph because because this is a nice study from Swiss scientists, Eric Fischer and Loretta Knuti, um, and it was published in Nature Climate Change in 2015, and this gives a global context. So this is looking globally about, about what this means. Um, so I'll try and be relatively brief about this, but I was actually asked to write a perspective piece for Nature Climate Change on this, and I was really struck by this study, so I, I did want to just talk about it for a minute. At the top there, you've got uh, rainfall, heavy rainfall, and on the bottom, you've got extreme temperatures. The leftmost panel is, is the present day, 
uh, as I say, we're about a degree warm, warmer than pre-industrial levels. The middle panel are the two, uh, a two degree world, where we've gone to two degrees relative to pre-industrial levels. The right hand panel is a three degree world, where we've gone to three degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial levels. And what these two scientists have done is they've worked out what are, how has that increased the odds of either very heavy rainfall falling on a particular day or very high temperatures on a particular day. And if I just summarize what that means, what they found was that um, if you look at the daily temperature extremes, about 75%, about three quarters of the daily temperature extremes now happening are attributable to human-induced climate change. Or what you could think of is that they would not have happened without our changing climate. And when we think of daily precipitation extremes, it's about 18%, 1.8%, again, attributable to human-induced climate change. In a two-degree world, that becomes 40% daily precipitation extremes then being due to climate change, on average, over the globe. But I find, as I wrote in my perspective piece, I found that a really sobering thought that about half of our heavy rainfall events in a two-degree world would not have happened without our having changed the climate. As we go, um, if we think about a wider range of impacts, and this is a study that was done under what's called the AVOID program, uh, which is a program um, from the UK looking at how um, our efforts to, to mitigate climate change, to reduce our emissions, how they would affect the impacts. And so this is a graphic that you can find on the AVOID website, which, which looks at that. It looks at heat waves, it looks at the effects of cropland, it looks at the, on, on the effects of flooding, and it looks, looks at the effects on water stress. In other words, the, 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 the availability for populations to have access to, to water, clean water. Um, and the point about this graphic is that if you top, look at the top line, that's the no mitigation world. That's a world where we have gone to five degrees relative to pre-industrial levels. And that's a world where the great majority of our populations are being affected by heat waves, where actually a really large fraction of our croplands are being degraded, where 120 million of people every year are being affected by flooding, and where you can see billions of people being affected by water stress. And as you go down that to the three degree world and the two degree world, you can see how we are significantly reducing those impacts. Actually, those impacts at a five degree world, it's hard to see how we could, the global population could really cope with that level of, of stress. But as we get down to, to the two degree world, this is still a world, as you heard from this morning, is still a world that we will need to adapt to. Um, quite significant levels of adaptation, but it is a world that is at least um, significantly different from this, this very extreme world of a five degree world. So with sustained effort, uh, we can really limit the severity of key impacts on people in society. So I just wanted to, to sum up with, with a few really basic points, really, and, and, and thank you for your attention. So the climate is warming, uh, that, is, that is a fact. That brings with it a greater risk of heat waves and heavy rainfall. Not all extreme weather is due to climate change. We, we know that the weather varies. We know there's been extreme weather in the past, but the data is showing us that the risks from that extreme weather, the, the, both in terms of that basic hazard, is increasing significantly and will increase significantly further with further levels of warming. And we have very good, robust evidence that tells us that taking action to limit climate change will significantly reduce the severity of key impacts on people and society. So I'll stop there and, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter.